My name is Chris Coyne, and I am the F.A. Harper Professor of Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and the Associate Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. Today I'm joined by Dr. Robert Higgs, who's a Senior Fellow in Political Economy for the Independent Institute and the Editor-at-Large of the Institute's quarterly journal, The Independent Review. Bob, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Glad to be here, Chris. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, one of the uh, main themes in your work, which is the growth of government. Uh, and it, I want to focus on your 1987 book, Crisis and Leviathan. Uh, and in that book, you put forth this idea of the ratchet effect. Uh, you, you develop this framework, and then you apply it to a, a host of historical episodes in the growth of government. Uh, and so uh, can you tell me a little bit about the ratchet effect framework um, what it entails, and also how it helps to explain the growth of government, uh, both historically, but also how it applies to more uh, contemporary issues as well. Well, the ratchet effect uh, in the abstract is, is the idea that uh, something is moving in, in only one direction, uh, at least to the extent that if it moves in that direction, it can't be fully returned to the direction or location where it was before. Most people know about ratchet wrenches for tightening uh, nuts on bolts. And so you keep moving the lever in the same direction and pulling it back and forth, but you don't loosen the boat, you, bolt, you only tighten it, or vice versa. Uh, a ratchet effect in, in relation to the growth of government is a, a phenomenon in which government grows, uh, uh, perhaps during some discrete episode, and I've focused on national emergency periods. But it grows abruptly, and then it, it later uh, declines. But it doesn't decline back to where it was before the episode, uh, or even uh, to where it would have been had the previous uh, growth trajectory continued, uh, instead of being displaced by the events of the, of the, um, the lurch. Uh, now, a lot of economists have studied the growth of government, and the general tendency has been to study it as a trend phenomenon. If we look back a century or more, we can measure in various ways how big the government was, and uh, we, we now see by those same measures that it's much bigger. And so the idea is to more or less to connect the dots or you know, to put in all the intervening data and then uh, draw a trend line through them. And then the objective is to explain why that trend uh, slopes upward as it does. Uh, now, if one, if one does uh, look at all the intervening observations in a long period of growth uh, of government such as that, what one sees is not, however, a, a, a movement along a smooth trend line. Uh, there are some economic and social data that do move smoothly like that. Uh, if you look, for example, at the growth of population over the last uh, uh, century or, or so in the United States, you'd see a very, very smooth uh, growth trend. It, uh, its rate of growth may shift a little bit uh, from time to time, but you could draw a trend line through the population values for the United States over the last century, and it would fit very closely the actual yearly observations. Uh, but uh, if you looked at a, uh, any of the common measures of the size of government during that same period, you would not find uh, a, uh, a trend line uh, tracked closely the actual movements of the, of the size of government. You would find instead that there were a number of discrete episodes, especially those uh, of associated with the two world wars and uh, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s, uh, and to some extent uh, later, uh, a period from the early 1960s to the early 1970s, and then later than that, a period uh, from 2008 uh, for the next several years, uh, three or four years at least, in which once again you had a discrete lurch in many measures of the size of government. So uh, I was... Uh, uh, drawn to uh, try to understand what relation, if any, exists between these aberrant periods of sudden growth in the size of government and the fact that there's a long-run upward trend. Uh, 
Are they just independent, for example? Many economists had treated them as independent. In fact, some economists had performed their analyses by excluding these periods from the analysis, especially the war years. They said, well, that's, that's not what we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand why, over the long run, the government has grown bigger. And it won't help us if we look at statistical outliers. Uh, that was how they conceived of these, these uh, particular episodes. Uh, as an economic historian, I, I had uh, learned a good deal about the details of what happened during these particular national emergency periods. And uh, it seemed to me right away that uh, to throw them out of the analysis uh, was to throw out uh, information that was actually critical to understanding the long-run movements. Uh, that indeed, uh, what happened during these national emergency periods uh, was critical to the fact that there was a long-run upward trend in the growth of government. That without them, that trend might have leveled off even, or even reversed itself conceivably at some point. So I began to work uh, with a focus on uh, the national emergency periods to try to integrate them into the study of the, of the long-run growth of, of government. And uh, my book, Crisis and Leviathan, which you mentioned, uh, published in 1987, uh, was the product of about five years of work along those lines in which I uh, studied the period from the late 19th century to the late 20th century uh, when, when the a book was published. Now, uh, there's a way to stylize uh, one's conception of the ratchet effect, uh, which is to divide it into phases. Uh, actual historical processes don't fall into patterns nearly so neatly. But uh, it's very helpful to stylize the uh, conception of the ratchet effect. And, and so the five phases I identify are the, the pre-crisis normality. Uh, that's when nothing unusual is happening. Uh, government may be growing, uh, but if so, it's probably growing fairly slowly. Uh, uh, then at the onset of a national emergency, uh, government begins to take actions that result in quite significant, unusual growth of government's size, scope, and power. Uh, that is, government begins to do a lot of things it wasn't doing before, uh, or it begins to do some of the things it was doing before uh, at a much higher level. Uh, then the, the third phase uh, is uh, the crisis phase itself. The crisis it takes a while to, to play out before it passes away, and during that phase, the government remains at a high level of operation. Uh, crises in the past have always ended, and when they've ended, as say the wars ended, uh, then uh, there's always been some retrenchment. Some of the government actions taken during phase two, uh, the upward lurch, are abandoned or scaled back. But uh, the retrenchment uh, has, in all these major episodes, been incomplete. So that when we arrive at phase five, uh, the post-crisis normality, government may be growing no faster than it was before the crisis, but even if so, it's growing uh, from a higher level. So the trajectory of the long-run growth of government is displaced upward by each of these crisis episodes. and. Uh, in my historical work, I've uh, tried in a variety of ways uh, uh, to discover uh, why it is that the retrenchment is incomplete. And there are several reasons why I believe that is the case. Now, other economists had studied uh, ratchet effects. Uh, uh, perhaps the most notable previous study was by uh, Peacock and Wiseman, two British economists who had who had uh, used this uh, notion to describe the, uh, the growth of uh, fiscal variables in, uh, in Great Britain during the early part of the 20th century. And Peacock and Wiseman had discovered, for example, that uh, British spending, government spending, or uh, British government taxation uh, revenues had all been displaced uh, tremendously upward uh, 
during each of the world wars and, and then fallen back after the wars, but not back fully to the pre-crisis level. And so there had been a, a definite ratchet effect in Britain as a result of each of the world wars. Uh, almost everybody who studied ratchets or thought about them uh, before my work uh, had thought about them in, term, in terms of fiscal variables uh, because that was the normal way economists had measured and continue to measure the size of government. Uh, how much money does it spend? How much tax revenue does it collect? How many people uh, does it employ? Uh, sometimes how much money does it borrow? Uh, how much does it guarantee in private loans or whatever? There are many ways to measure the magnitude of government's current activity. But all of these are, are ways that economists like because there are quantitative data that can be found uh, to, to uh, describe what's happened and to analyze it econometrically. As, I, as I've said before, many economists think if you can't model something, you don't have anything. So if you're going to fit a, an econometric model to, to the growth of government, you need some quantitative data that will facilitate your doing so. Now, my conception of the ratchet effect in the growth of government is, is quite different because my conception of what we mean by the size of government is, is more complete, I think. Uh, I'm interested not only in the level at which government operates, how much does it spend, for example. I'm interested also in the scope of government activity. How many uh, questions that were previously answered by private parties uh, in, the, in uh, the private sector of the economy uh, have now come to be answered by government officials, legislators, or bureaucrats. Uh, when, when there's an increase uh, in, in government's decision making that displaces uh, that same kind of decision making previously made by private parties without interference from government, then we have an increase in the scope of government. So uh, government over time is it become involved in many, many things it was not previously involved in. And that widening of the scope uh, is a very important way in which government changes the operation uh, of economic life. Uh, even though it may not necessarily spend uh, a great deal more money, and sometimes it, it won't necessarily spend any more money. It, it simply broadens the authority it exercises over private decision making, and it may use that authority in ways that show up in private accounts. For example, if government uh, takes responsibility for, for pollution control, it may uh, pass laws or create agencies like the EPA that tell people they have to take certain actions to, to prevent pollution or to moderate the extent of it. Uh, but when private parties undertake those uh, compliance actions, that's money spent on the account of firms or individuals, not money spent uh, on the EPA's account. So uh, an increase in the scope of uh, government activity is, is critically important, uh, as well as an increase in the uh, amount of money spent or the number of people hired uh, on the government payroll. And the third uh, aspect of government that I include in my notion of the size of government, and therefore in my notion of the ratchet effect, is government's power. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, government exerts its power, uh, changes uh, the degree of power it exerts uh, in ways that don't show up either in measures of scope or scale. Uh, uh, recently, for example, the government has undertaken to, to uh, impose mass surveillance on the entire population and not only the entire population of the United States, but uh, and m many people in the rest of the world as well. So the activities of uh, government agencies like the uh, NSA and, uh, uh, have placed people's electronic communications under surveillance in a massive way. Uh, and uh, the government is now uh, exercising this, 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 this power of surveillance uh, which places all private actors under a cloud of suspicion. They're being watched by government because, because government thinks they are potential criminals, they're potential terrorists, they're potential wrongdoers uh, of some kind, child molesters, tax evaders, drug dealers, uh, you name it. Uh, 
but uh, it turns out that once you put people under mass surveillance and you're watching everybody and accumulating information on their emails and their phone calls and any other form of communication that leaves an electronic trail, uh, you put the government in a position to be very selective about whom it uh, prosecutes, whom it goes after, in some cases uh, whom it kills uh, peremptorily uh, as, as it does now uh, killing people uh, in many parts of the world with, with drone rockets. Uh, so uh, this increase in the power of government through the use of surveillance is a critically important thing, but if you were looking at normal measures of government's scale or scope, you might miss it altogether. So uh, I've been at pains throughout my work to, to pay attention to, to uh, the size, scope, and power of government and to see how all of those things have changed during episodes uh, I characterized as uh, evincing the ratchet effect.